Hey, welcome to Canyon Ridge. My name is Drew Moore. I'm the lead pastor here, and we are excited to be in a series called Meeting God Again. There's a Grand Canyon difference between learning about something and learning about someone. Coming to know someone over time takes time. It takes experience and attention. And so in this season, we're just giving our full attention to God, allowing Him to introduce Himself to us through the scripture, whether for the first time or just being introduced again. As we celebrate Him, we'll only grow in confidence to live well with Him and with other people. And so we come together like this. We sing out in worship, we celebrate communion, so you may wanna have something ready to participate in that. And of course, we look into the scripture to hear from God. Here we go. Come 
love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of
our rock, oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. And listen, if that's hard for you to sing, hard for you to believe, we can call upon the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal, to help us to see God's faithfulness. It's always saying, I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. We just sing that one more time. We're calling on the Holy Spirit. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. Almighty river, come and fill. That's our prayer, that we would be filled with the revelation from the Holy Spirit of your goodness, of your faithfulness, that in the moments where we wonder where you might be, that we would be able to look upon the truth that we read about in Scripture, of all the stories, God, that, that we know, that we get to lean on, that we get to read about, about your faithfulness, God but that the Holy Spirit would also help us to see your faithfulness active in our lives even still. God, that we would be able to see that you're still working, you're still moving, you're not finished with your people. And that we get to be the stories of faithfulness for generations to come. So we call on the Holy Spirit in those moments. We're grateful for the gift of the Spirit. We're grateful for Jesus, who made all this possible through his sacrifice on the cross. We're so grateful, God. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Let's check out this story together. So Bailey was going to camp for a long time here on campus. Every year, it's a really great reminder of how important God is and just feeling like community through camp and just leaving like our normal places here in like Vegas to go to California or even Arizona just to experience God and community is so, so important. And then once she entered middle school, I unfortunately went through a divorce and didn't have the funds anymore to pay for middle school camp. And it was a really rough, like five years, very rough, because I took a job that would better accommodate my kids' schedules, which paid absolutely nothing. But I felt that it was really important for me to be there with them with this big change um, before and after school. And God is so faithful. Like, you know, it's so easy to stop giving when you don't have enough, right? And I like just trusted that God would provide for so many years. And, and you know, he did. And it was so easy for me to walk away from that. Like so easy. So many times I'd sit going through my checkbook and thinking like, there's no way. We got help from Canyon Ridge a lot. So grateful for that opportunity. Thankfully, she went to high school camp. When she goes to register, they give her an envelope. And that envelope changed everything. I don't know why, like all the other times that I, that I got financial assistance, it, I felt very grateful for it. But once I got that envelope and I gave it to Bailey and she opened it and she's like, oh, it's money for our food for when we go there and we come back. And I was just floored. I don't know why it hit me the way it did, but from that moment forward, I was like, I'm gonna do this one day. And when I can, I'm gonna make sure that I do it well once she started going to high school camp, I was able to get back a little bit more of my time, go into the career field I went into, got my degree, and was able to make a little bit more financially to be able to accommodate camp. Now I'm so fortunate, I can send her myself, but I am never gonna forget that awesome opportunity that was given to her and not pay that forward. 
Sure enough, this year came around, I got in contact with Aaron and I was like, hey, I wanna do this like they did for Bailey. So tell me what I have to do. And she told me just to put money in envelopes, write notes to them. I got five envelopes, put 20 bucks in each, wrote great notes to them so that they could have just inspired to be like, this is what I'm going to camp for, you know? I mean, those camps, I, I really think does something. Even when she talks to me, she's my biggest cheerleader. Like, I've been through so much and she knows it. And she is always there. Like, it's just changed her mentality, her love, her grace for people. And I know that that has a lot to do with what she's learned here, what she's learned at camp, the community that she has gotten from coming to um, Canyon Ridge for all these years. There was a time in my life where I was very anxious and insecure, but now I can say I'm fulfilled by God and confident and happy with the person I'm becoming. Do you have a story like that? Yeah, there was a time in my life where I was very hopeless and uh, very scared. I think through the power of generosity and seeing other people provide for, for my kids, not just here at church, but everywhere, I was able to see that there is hope and that there are good people and that there are generous people so that now I can be one of those that can help a kid go to camp and experience the same things that my daughter did. That is like, just comes full circle for me. So there's a lot of really amazing things about Izzy's story. Uh, her story, similar to a lot of ours, is just uh, of people who desire to be generous. We just wanna be people who are, uh, are responding to all that God has brought into our lives by sharing with others. You heard her say, listen, I've received help from Canyon Ridge. Canyon Ridge is not a place, Canyon Ridge is not an organization, it's this group of people. And so people came around her and you saw how fundamentally important that was. Each summer we take middle school and high school students away for a week, any of them who wanna jump in, and uh, it is an amazing week of giving God our full attention and like it was just establishing some really important relationships, first with God and with other people. And the truth is, that's not cheap. Does anybody have teenagers in your house? There's nothing cheap about having teenagers in your house. We had some boys sleep over a, a couple days ago with, with one of my sons, and listen, the amount of pizza was obscene. It was just not okay, right? Uh, and listen, sending them away for a week is a similar story, and the truth is, in the, in the culture and climate in which we live, and the ups and downs of people's lives, people often find themselves in a place needing help, and we just wanna be people who come around them. So I just wanna point your attention uh, to an opportunity. Uh, we give all the time around here. If you are a guest and you're just checking things out, or you're trying to find your way in the direction of Jesus, please feel no pressure. This is who we want to become. Jesus said it's better to give than to receive. And we're just finding that to be true. And so we just wanna grow in that all the time. We give regularly here as a part of our church. But on top of that, I just wanna encourage you, if you have some margin, if you have the ability, you could be a part of helping send kids to camp this summer. It's so critical. Like It costs about what, 500 bucks, I think, in the, in the neighborhood of 500 bucks to send a middle school or a high school student to camp for a week, which sounds like a lot, but the, what you get in the middle of that is absolutely amazing. If we could be the kind of people who support families who just can't manage that, or that sticker shock alone just blows them away, or they're just like, I don't know how to do that, we get to step in and say, here's some help. You, you do part, we'll do part. The church will come around you in an important way. So today you have an opportunity to do that. There's gonna be a, a, a QR show up on the screen here in just a minute. You could literally grab your phone and donate right now. It could be five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 100 bucks, 1,000 bucks, whatever it is. You could jump in and we saw people on top of people on top of people do this last year and I could tell you stories. We could watch videos for the next four hours of people whose lives have been turned right side up because of the generosity of other people. You can also swing by, uh, there's a wall that's set up with some cards outside. I really wanna encourage you to swing by. Some of the student staff, some of the students who've been to camp are gonna be there. You could hear some more about camp. It's just outside the main doors to the left, somewhere between the donuts and the coffee truck, all right? So I'm sure you can find it with that description. You'll see some stories. You'll be invited to pray alongside some people you can give there. But listen, I just wanna encourage you, if you have a little bit of extra, even if you'd be willing to set aside a little bit of extra. Listen, skip the coffee shop this week and put some money back in your wallet and put it in the direction of some students whose lives can be turned right side up, it'd be worth it. Uh, we just wanna come around families really, really well. I would love to see story on top of story on top of story like Izzy's unfold, that families were really helped by the generosity of us. And so I just wanna encourage you to do that. 
Listen, uh, we are jumping in to our series. We're in week three of a series called Meeting God Again. Listen, it's a very, very different thing to introduce a topic than it is to introduce a person. I've been married 23 years right now, and I'm still coming to know my wife. As soon as I think I know her, I'm like, okay, that's not totally true yet, right? We get to discover people all the way along. We get to find out who they are. A friend of mine said it this way. He wants to have a PhD in his friend Drew. Like when he sees a new corner of my life, he gets really curious because we just wanna walk deep, we wanna see each other clearly, we wanna support one another well. Coming to know someone takes time. It's a little bit at a time and it's a bit of an adventure along the way. In fact, a guy named A.W. Tozer said this, I said this the first week, I just wanna remind you. He said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And like I said week one, too many times we treat God like a topic, like something to understand, like something to master, or we look into God's word and we think, I gotta know this. No, 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 we wanna know him. And knowing him is different than knowing a this. Knowing a him is different than knowing an it. And we wanna set off on that kind of path. He said, listen, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. He says, because we tend by the secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. Uh, it's like this, if you think God is a taskmaster, you're either gonna work your tail off or hide from the chores, right? If you think God is just some distant, uncaring person, then you'll probably respond, just like, listen, I guess he doesn't care, we'll just do our own thing. If you think there is no God, then you're just gonna eat, drink, and be merry, make the most of today, because tomorrow we die, right? What we think about God will absolutely, unintentionally, even unconsciously affect the way that we live our lives. What we're finding as followers of Jesus and, and the people of Canyon Ridge is we just wanna know him better all the time. Not know about him, not know of him, but know God from experience. And so we've been jumping in to the book of the Bible called the Psalms. In fact, if you have your Bible, I want you to go to Psalm 33, all right? You're gonna find them in numeric order, which is very convenient, 33, okay? Psalm 33 we're gonna jump into because we're gonna look at yet another aspect of God. Week one we talked about his generosity, last week we talked about his goodness, this week we're gonna talk about how trustworthy God is. Psalm 33 verses uh, one through five, it says this. Uh, it says, let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise him. Praise the Lord with melodies on the lyre and make music with him, uh, for him on the 10 stringed harp. Sing a new song of praise to him Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. Now, all of that is this celebration. This psalm actually would have been sung by the Hebrew people going, uh, uh, there's two festivals, they would have thought about this, one in the fall, one at New Year, but they would sing this annually, and it would be part of this huge celebration. And so as they're singing and as they're traveling, they would start to call to mind all the good things God has done. And then they say something that's just a little bit uh, startling. He says this, for the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything he does. He loves whatever is just and good and unfailing love, the unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. This song, like I said, at an annual celebration just kind of reflects on what they know of God. And listen, I just wanna go back to verse four. We shouldn't just read that really too quickly because it says, the word of the Lord holds true and we can trust, what does it say after that? We can trust what? Oh, <laughs> like really? Hey, uh, if you're sitting next to somebody that you know, uh, just like throw a, like a friendly elbow, just like, yeah, I see you, I know you, I'm with you, okay? And if you did that, here's what I want you to do. On a scale of one to 10, how, do you, how much do you trust them? Do you trust them like one to 10? Maybe just tell them out loud right now, this could be fun, go. We have marriage counseling if you need it, okay? Anybody that just discovered they need it, that's fine. Listen, we read things so quickly and so fast, like, yeah, we can trust God with everything. Yeah, we can trust God with everything. Wait, 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 would you just think about that for a minute? Like, really? Really everything? Let's be honest, people. Let's not just say what we're supposed to say. Let's like be authentic. Let's be the kind of people who say what we mean, mean what we say, and live what we say, right? We're gonna trust God with everything? What a startling statement. If we really, what would it look like to actually trust him with everything? And if we're going to do that, then we gotta find out that he's trustworthy. 
Now, you all, hopefully this week, are gonna jump into Psalm 33 alongside some great people. Uh, we've been jumping into this the last couple of weeks. I'll show you how to do that here in just a little bit. But when you do, later this week, you're gonna come to the end of Psalm 23. And, and after this kind of song, this thing that they sing, they lay out how good God is, how strong God is, how he's the ruler of everyone. And not only is he a ruler, but he's a loving ruler. And then they're gonna talk about, listen, because of that and because of all you've done, we're gonna trust you even more. And so it comes to verse 20 and it says this, we put our trust, we put our hope, any confident expectation expectation of good, which is what hope is, that we have, we're gonna put that in the Lord. He is our help and our shield, which is not some kind of B team, like hold me up kind of help. This word help means like a warrior that you call to your side when you're not sure it's gonna turn out well. That's this word. Azar is like, I need someone to come and fight alongside me. I'm not gonna make it without this kind of help. This is who God is. Or our shield, he says, the one who protects us, who guards us, who provides refuge. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you. What does it say at the end? Trust God with everything. Our confident expectation is in you alone, God. Those are bold words. That's high degree of trust. Hi, as I started to look into this idea of trust, I was thinking and reflecting on how it develops, and, and you all know this, but I'm gonna put some names to things that you already know. Like, what does it take to trust someone? The elbow that you threw just a minute ago and said, I trust you, at a 10, right? And you, you lied, some of you lied, okay? <laughs> so you might, some of you, just lower your number because they just lied to you. We know what it takes to build trust, and we know what violates trust. We've experienced both of those, but if you take every, what everyone says about trust, there's at least three major things that show up that are absolutely required for trust. Three questions that we're always asking if we can trust someone as we grow in a relationship over time is, number one, are they competent? Like, can we trust what they say because they can actually, they have the ability to follow through on what they say? Right? Are they able? If we're gonna trust someone, we need to know that they're able. Like in the example last week, Mitch was talking about a mechanic. They need to have a certain skill set to be able to follow through on what they say they can do with your car. Are they competent? The second is motivation. Are they good? Like do they have good in mind? Do they want something from me or do they want something for me and with me? What we're finding with God is he definitely wants way more for us and with us than he wants from us. It's always a partnership. Competence and motivation. But then there's this third question of reliability. Like, will they actually show up? Does anybody have a flaky friend? Listen, I, there's, I have some flaky friends, and I just know. It's, it's gonna be like a coin flip if they show up sometimes. Like, if they promise to be there, they'll be there. They're trustworthy, but there's also just like, nah, you know, they do their thing. They kind of move from place to place. No, no, no. If we're really gonna trust people, we're gonna move in the direction of greater and greater trust. We wanna know they're trustworthy, and if they are, this is, the, this is what we hope to find, that they're not only able to follow through, but they want good for us, they will follow through, they desire for that, and finally, they're gonna be reliable, they're gonna show up in the end. When you read Psalm 33, and I hope you will, whether you're in a study or not, I hope you'll jump into Psalm 33. You're gonna see this layout in all the way through. Because right after what we read, what the psalmist does is start to describe how strong God is. He talks about how he created everything. And listen, if you can speak and nothing becomes something, I'm gonna put you in the competent category. You are able at that point. He points at God's ability. You'll see it in verses like five through nine, something like that. And then he goes on and he says, listen, not only are you able to do all these things, but you are the ruler of all mankind. He says, some people put their trust in lots of other things, but listen, you are the one who's in charge. Which, if he's mean, that's terrifying. But he goes on and says, no, 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 his desire for us is good. You have always taken care of your people. Goes through the whole thing. He talks not only about the competence, but God's motivation. His desire is for good for us. And then they place their trust again in him because what they've been doing through this whole song is calling to mind all the times God has shown up faithfully, how grateful we can be for the ways in which he's shown up. And so right in the middle of this, you'll see this whole thing unfold, that God is this kind of trustworthy one. He's not some category. He's not a subject to be mastered. He is one who can be, we can entrust ourselves to. He has earned that. And here's how you can actually find out. Those of us who are like, ah, you know, I trust God, it's not really like, do I trust him or do I not trust him? It'd be really great if it was, but trust is not a light switch. Can, I, can we all just agree? It's not all trust or no trust. Trust in relationship grows over time. 
Little by little, like I trust you with a little bit of me and you trust, I like, there's this couple, I was meeting outside, I had a blast talking with them about hiking and uh, I was just, it just occurred to me, I'm like, I don't, I don't think they know I work here. I seem like an interrogator right now. <laughs> but we just, just a little bit, hey, I'll offer you a little bit, you offer me a little bit. And this is this exchange back and forth and like you offer me some information, I'll offer you some information and then what you do with that will let me know if you're trustworthy and we'll just kind of back and forth find our way through this and it was great. Right? We know this is actually how trust works. Sometimes we just throw all that out the window with God and we think it's a light switch. Well, I trust God or I don't trust God. No, it's not a light switch. It's a journey, right? And this whole idea of trust him with a little bit, trust him with a little bit, see what he does, this is what we need to find our way through. And I just wanna point at the pattern that you're gonna see and you'll just acknowledge, you'll, you'll shake your head at it. This is how trust works. It's in the same verse I've already read, verse four. He they said this, for the word of the Lord holds true and we can trust everything he does. Here's how trust is built. You listen to what they say, and then you watch what they do. Can I get a head nod? That's true. That's how trust is built. And if you say something and you don't do it, trust goes down. That's it, yeah? Say and do. If they match up, trust has the capacity to grow. So here's what I wanna say. As we all become people who grow in our trust of God and find out exactly how trustworthy he is, don't change the pattern. Listen to what he says, watch what he does. Listen to what he says, watch what he does. But it all starts with listen. So with a bossy voice, here's what I want you to do. Turn to the person you threw an elbow at earlier and with like a conviction, just say, listen. <laughs> if you're gonna find out if anybody is trustworthy, first you gotta find out what they said. It all starts with listening. This is the kind of people we wanna be, which is exactly why we always look into God's word. It's why we're always trying to collect one another up and look into God's word together. It's why some of you are doing like the, the work. How many of you guys have written more words in the last couple weeks than in your life? Because you're normally thumbs and typing, but we've been doing some copying and some writing from Psalms in this study. Uh, it looks like this, and we've got some more. If you want one on the way out, we would love for you to have one. A really simple pattern to look into the Psalms. This week is Psalm 33 to do some copying and then to internalize it by putting it in your own words and then to put it into practice by taking some kind of step. This is the kind of way that we can listen well to God. We don't wanna find out about him. We wanna speak with him and hear from him. And simple tools like this help us do that. So if you don't have one of these, grab one. If you're a digital person, scan the QR code. We'll send you a link. You can get all the things along the way. But find your way into a place where you are listening regularly to what God says. Now, I'm gonna give you step two, but I'm not gonna tell you much about it yet. The first one, what was the first step? What was it? Listen, a little boss in it, okay? A little bit of snarky in it, it's fine. The second step is do. Now, you might skip this step at first, and I'll tell you why in a second. The first one is you gotta do something with what you hear. Now, you don't actually have to do this at first, I'll explain it in a minute, but then step three, you better watch what happens. Listen, do, watch, repeat. Listen, do, watch, repeat. And in this way, like a wheel rolling forward, round and round, you make progress in growing trust with one another. This is what I did years ago when I jumped into my journey with the Psalms. God says you're this, would you help me see you're this? And I just watch. And over and over, he would show up in exactly who he said he was. And in that way, you just find yourself looking back and saying, God, you are so trustworthy. And so what starts by entrusting him with small things, listening in small things and responding in small ways grow into bigger and bigger ways, more like a snowball rolling downhill than a wheel rolling forward. Listen, this is how we can do this. Now, I told you you can skip step two when you begin, because some of you are like, listen, I've never trusted God with anything. I'm not about to do what he says. I don't know if he's trustworthy. That's fine. Skip step two for a little while. You can only get so far skipping step two, but skip step two, you can do it this way. With the person you threw an elbow at, like you, they, you came along with them because you love them or you found your way into this place just because you're looking for something better but you're not really sure about actually orienting your life toward God or doing what he says. Listen, there's space for you. Ask questions all day long. Have doubts all day long but here's what I would encourage you to do. Listen to your friends and watch how it plays out. Listen to what God is up to in their lives and watch how God changes the way they live. This kind of pattern can help you develop trust. It's like when you introduce someone to someone else. They'll tell you stories of why this person is trustworthy and that might just get you over the hump to actually respond to that same person as well. 
So listen, uh, how many of you have stories of God showing up in your life well? Anybody have stories of God showing up in your life well? Okay, listen, if that's you, tell the stories to one another. Even if the person next to you also has stories, exchange the stories. This is why Psalm 33 is what it is. Over and over and over, they would repeat this song. It was like the song that never ends. Have you guys ever heard the song that never ends? Yeah, you Google it, but not around kids, because you'll ruin your day, okay? It's supposed to be cyclical. God, you're so good, we're singing about your goodness, and so we trust you with everything, because you made everything, and you rule everything, and you have good in mind for us, and so we're gonna trust you, and when you trust you, now I got new things to trust you with. Every year they would sing the same song, but with a whole new set of memories and God's faithfulness. We wanna be people always telling the stories of God's faithfulness, because it builds our trust in him. And so listen, today, tell some stories, all right? So uh, here's what's gonna happen. If you have a story, if you have a story, just turn to someone next to you and say, listen, 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 just tell the stories today. Now, I just wanna take this a layer deeper because it's one thing to sit on, stand on a stage and look at the Bible and say, listen, we can trust God with everything. He's trustworthy, and so here's how you trust him. It's very analytical, it's all the kind of things, but that's not even the most important question. The most important question is not, is God trustworthy? The question is, can I trust God? Listen, it's a whole different thing to watch 15 people cliff jump into the Colorado River in front of you than it is to stand at the top and decide if you're gonna jump. It's a whole different thing. You can watch the roller coaster all day long and you can watch people get on and then get off safely, right? But when you're clicking your way up the hill, things are about to get real. And if we're gonna talk about real life, we need to talk about when things get real, because my guess is in your life, there's things in your life getting real right now. In fact, call to mind some of the things in your life that feel way more real than you would like them to be. This is where God can be trusted with everything matters the most. Yes, it's still gonna happen by listen, do, watch, repeat. Listen, do, watch, repeat. But if it doesn't make its way into the thing that's causing your stomach to turn just a little bit right now, like as you're waiting for the diagnosis, as you're trying to get the appointment, as you watch the bank account dwindle, as you're concerned about the meeting that's coming up this week, as you wonder where the person who used to sit next to you is and what's going on in your relationship, as you think about the family member that's struggling right now and you're not sure what to do with it, this is where it matters. It's one thing to say, yeah, we can trust God with everything, but here's my question, can you trust God with that thing? And I just wanna acknowledge, I, I can think of really two really good reasons why you wouldn't. I just wanna give you two really good reasons that we all have to not trust God, okay? Here's number one. Because everyone else has let us down. Lots of people don't trust God because they think of God a lot like people. And uh, I would do a show of hands of how many people have had others break trust, but Maybe just internally raise your hand. Don't, don't do it out loud. Don't, like, don't do it visibly. How do you raise your hand out loud? I don't know. <laughs> Have you ever been not trustworthy? Have you ever let somebody down? Listen, all of our experience says we can only trust people so much. Our whole life says I'm afraid to trust all the way because I've been let down. And I just wanna say that's 100% real. People will let us down, and we have let people down, yeah? And so our whole experience of relationships says, I can't trust all the way. I want to trust all the way. I wish I had someone to trust all the way, but I can't trust all the way because people have failed us. Can I get a mm-hmm? We've expected things from people and they didn't deliver. I just want you to know that's a universal experience. Even Jesus himself experienced this. John chapter two says this, that even when people began to trust him, Jesus didn't trust them. Why? Because he knew all about people. Anybody know all about people? Mm -hmm. No one needed to tell him about human nature because he knew what was in each person's heart. Now he knew it in a special way, he knew it in a different way than we do, but we got enough experience to know 
And this applies to every single person, including Christian people, maybe especially Christian people. But I have good news for you. Even though every single person has or will let you down in some very small, or I'm sad to say, in really tragic, heartbreaking, life-shaping ways, God's not like people. He's not like us. If he were, you shouldn't trust him all the way. And Psalm 33 would be crazy talk. But he's not like us. The story of Jesus is not he's like us. The story of Jesus is we're becoming like him. And so listen, if you are one of those people who have watched Christian people and said, if that's what it's like, I'm out. I just wanna say, you're smart. Like that's right. If you look at a bunch of imperfect people and say, if that's what it's about, I'm out, I like you already. That's just good discernment. Because people who follow Jesus are not perfect, they're just as broken as you are, they have just as many challenges as you are. The difference is we have help that is not of ourselves. And so here's what I would encourage you to do, not look at a snapshot of one follower of Jesus' life, instead, watch a season of their life. Listen to what God is doing and watch what he does over time. Because we will not, God will not be like us, we will become more like him. You'll see people who grow in trust, who grow in generosity, who grow in faithfulness, who grow in humility, who know how to ask for and receive forgiveness, who know how to show up in generous ways. We become more like him. The story of God is not he's like us. God is not a big man, he's not a big person, he's not like just a little bit better than the best person you've ever met, he is other. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, his ways are not our ways, he does not need our help, he is not lacking anything, he is other. And he cares so much that he would help us forward. I know that the people in your life have not been trustworthy, but I just wanna tell you, he's not like them. That's reason number one, I get it. You might not wanna trust God all the way because it's really hard to trust people all the way. Here's the second reason you may not wanna trust God all the way. And this one's really delicate, like super delicate. You might get mad in a minute, but please stay with me for a second. You may not wanna trust God because not only have people failed you, but you feel like God has failed you. Like, it's really hard for you to hear God is trustworthy. And you're like, oh yeah? Let me tell you this. Whatever you thought would shape up or whatever you expected in life. I was just talking with somebody uh, after church last night and just lamenting that how hard life can be. And how often we find ourselves in a season that we thought would be one way and it is not that way at all. The people we thought would be there are not there. The person we thought we would be, we are not. The thing we begged God to do, he didn't. The thing we begged God to take away, he didn't. The thing we came asking for the most and were so convinced was next, didn't happen and it felt all the way soul deep like God quit, like God failed, like God flaked. I don't know if he was able to help, I don't know if he wanted to help, I don't know if he forgot but he didn't and God failed. And so Psalm 33, four, trust him, everything he does is trustworthy. Here's, here's the delicate part, I, I, I don't. We feel like God has failed. And sometimes it's because we expected something he never promised. I, listen. That take, I'm not taking anything away from the grief or sadness of your loss or your experience. That can totally coexist. God is so strong, he's not just able to take away and bring relief and rescue and all those things. He's so strong, he can carry us through even those things without failing. He can be trustworthy even when it doesn't go the way that we want it to. And so many times we like speak for God and say this is how it's gonna go and God said, I never said it was gonna go that way. 
I never said I would pull you out of every fire. I never said I would give you that person forever. I never said I would make it feel like this or look like this. I know we all have expectations. That's being human, right? We all have these things. But listen, we don't like to be held to promises we never made, do we? How many times do people show up and put expectations on us and then punish for us, punish us for when we don't meet them? And we're like, I never said I would do that. I just wonder if sometimes that's what God is doing with us. Listen, it may feel like God has failed, but I just wanna encourage you to look back and say, did God ever promise? What was God saying all along the way? This is why listen, do, watch starts with, what was it again, what does it start with? Jesus' friends and followers struggled with this for sure, like struggled soul deep with this. Like he gathered up this group of people and Jesus was saying, listen, the kingdom has come. I'm gonna make things right. This struggle that your people have had for centuries, like you, don't, you can't even imagine a generation of your family, Peter, James, and John, where your people were not in struggle, where they were not oppressed and I'm here to bring life, to bring rescue, to do all of the things. And like, yes, finally, a conquering king is gonna show up and power up and win over and put all those people in their place. And Jesus is like, nope. Not what I said. In fact, they were so determined that their expectations were right. They were (laughs) blown away when Jesus gave his life, even though he told them like three, four, five different times specifically, this is exactly what he would do. Listen, God's ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so he sits down with his friends on the night that he would be betrayed and he says, listen, don't let your hearts be troubled which is another staggering statement, right? Because there's things in your life that trouble you right now. Like I only need to ask you this simple question, what keeps you up at night? And I bet you have a list of five things. And again, the question is not, can God be trusted with everything? The question is, can God be trusted with that thing? And so Jesus looks at his friends in the middle of hardship and he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. He says, what does it say? Trust in God and Trust also in me, trust me, trust me. Just I get good in mind for you. I'm so capable, I'm not gonna flake on you. Trust in God. I have all the capacity needed, God says, trust me. I have all the good, in, I have more good in mind for you than you could ever imagine for yourself. Just trust me. Listen, I'm not gonna abandon you. Jesus, over and over through the whole scripture, God, Jesus himself saying, listen, I will not leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you the whole of every moment. There is no one who is trustworthy like God is. And so as you call those things to mind, the question is not, can you trust God with everything? Can you trust God with that thing? Can you trust God with the next thing? What's the thing that's causing you anxiety, causing you fear? It's full of ambiguity. This is the very next opportunity for you to grow in trust and relationship with him. If you'll just offer that to him and say, God, this is the thing right now, and then jump into the three steps. What were the three steps again? Listen, do, and watch. We entrust ourselves to things. This is, this is what we do, right? We entrust ourselves to things. So that thing that you are trying to manage the anxiety of, here's how you know what you're trusting in right now instead of God. This is like hard work I had to do in me. Here's how, how would you finish this sentence? Listen, I know, uh, I know this is hard, but I'll be okay because what? How do you finish the sentence? I'll be okay because. Well, I know money's tight, but I'll be okay because I have a nest egg. Oh, you know where your trust is. You know what? I, I know that relationships are hard right now, but I'll be okay because we've gone through this before. Just waiting it out. You know, I, I, I know it's really hard at work, but I'll figure it out, I'll figure it out before. I'll be okay because I know how to figure it out. These are the scripts we write all the time. I'll be okay, I'll be okay. It's like when I put my kids on a roller coaster for the first time. You know like when a teenager straps you in, I'm like, I'm not sure you're qualified, but okay. (laughs) You sit down with your kid who like stood on his tippy toes to meet the height requirement, right? And they put the thing over and they click it in and they they do the thing and they're like, hey, this is so good because it's just sitting still, it's totally flat, everything's good, everything's calm, everybody's fine. And then all of a sudden it starts to move, right? And then what do you start to say? Listen, it's fine, look at this thing, it's not gonna move, you're clicked in, there's no way you're gonna fall out. Listen, I've gone on this before too. I'm right here with you, all the reasons, these are the things we ask them to trust all the way. And they still scream their faces off. Here's how you know 
you're really growing in trust of God. We know we're trusting God when we finish the sentence like this. And it's the first thing we finish the sentence with. I know I'll be okay. Not it'll be okay. Sometimes it's not okay. But I know I'll be okay because God has provided a nest egg for me. Because God has surrounded me with great people. Because God will never leave my side. Because God has never failed. Because God is for me, not against me. Because God rescued me. He didn't condemn me. Because God over and over and over. And so listen, let's be people who grow in trust of God. Here's how we know we can trust in God. Step number one was what? Tell somebody. Listen. Whatever it is that you're struggling with right now, here's the question that will reveal whether you're listening. What does God have to say about this? Not what do my friends have to say, not what does my boss have to say, not what does the doctor have to say, not what does the best books on the subject have to say, certainly not what does Wikipedia say. (laughs) Or WebMD, terrible idea, always, always. Listen, God, what do you have to say about this? This is why we're always taking in what he has to say. And then here's the most important step, and this is where it gets real. You can't skip this step if you wanna have a relationship with God. You cannot skip this step. Step step number two was what? Do. Here's the question you gotta ask, or here's what you gotta do. You gotta do what someone who believes him would do. You gotta act like what you heard is already true. You gotta act as if. This is what happens in our relationships. I have to act like you are trustworthy before I can find out if you are. Right, there's no way to experience the jump until you leave the cliff. At some point, if you've watched enough in your friends, if you've listened closely enough to God's character, you gotta put it into practice. You gotta let the rubber meet the road, and you gotta choose to live in the tension of not knowing how it's going to turn out. You cannot find out if it's trustworthy until you crest the hill. Right, this is what has to happen. You gotta find a step that says, God, I've listened the best I know how, and I'm gonna do exactly what someone who believed you were right would do. And then finally, you gotta watch, and watch close, with the anticipation and the expectation that God is going to show up. Be attentive, we've said this, relationships only grow with attention and availability. You can only find out if you give God your attention, watching for how God will respond. Psalm 33 will help build your trust. So can you trust God? Here are the steps. Tell somebody the three steps. What are they? Listen, do, watch, repeat. Listen, do, watch, repeat. Listen, do, watch, repeat. Over and over and watch your trust grow. On the way in, you found communion. I wanna encourage you to grab that right now. Jesus lived like this. Now listen, we could get all into all the complexities of God being both God and man, but Jesus did experience life as a human, right? He never ceased being God, but he did experience all the tensions of ambiguity, right? He suffered in every way, Hebrews says, so that we would know we are understood. He was made like us in every way. I don't know how all that works, but here's what I know. His life is marked by listen, do, watch, repeat. Listen, do, watch, repeat. From the time he's a teenager, he's taking in God's word in the temple. From the very beginning of his ministry, he spends 40 days in the desert listening to God for the call on his life. Over and over, you see him withdraw to lonely places to pray, the Gospel of Mark says, so he could listen, and then he put it into practice, and then he watched, and he would see what would happen. And it led up to a moment, like like a life-altering moment like a world, your life altering, like world altering moment. In Luke chapter 22, just after having dinner with his closest friends, it says that he was accompanied by his disciples in Luke chapter 22, it says he left the upstairs room and went, what is this next two words, he went what? As usual, he had this habit of listening to God to the Mount of Olives and there he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. And then he goes on and says, listen, he walked about a stone's throw away and he knelt down and he prayed. He was speaking, listening to God. Father, if you are willing, please, you've prayed this prayer. You've prayed this. Please take this away from me. Jesus knew what was ahead. He knew he was gonna give his life. He knew he would die on all of our behalf, and he knew it was gonna be rough. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. And then this is really powerful word. Listen, 
I love that Jesus prayed this because you should pray this. Whatever that anxiety is that you're carrying, whatever that worry is, whatever keeps you up at night, that's the next thing to trust him with. And you need to start by saying, God, here's what I want. Would you take this away? Would you heal me? Would you bring us back together? Would you make a way? I cannot figure this thing out. Listen, start there, that's great. But then there's this three letter word that matters so much. And only a person who really trusts God and is growing in trust of God would use this word. Then Jesus says, yet. Here's what I want. Here's what I want, God, but yet. All of that, true, yet. And then he says this, I want your will to be done, not mine. This is where trust gets real. God, I got a lot of good ideas, yet what I want to want, what I really want, God, would you help it be what I want, is what you want, not what I want. And how amazing that Jesus said this. Only because he said this do we take this little piece of bread and this little cup of juice, reminding us of Jesus' body and blood, which he gave for each and every one of us. He had no sin, he had no fault, and yet he died on our behalf so that we would never have to wonder if we have a place with God. We would never have to wonder if God was not only capable of rescuing us from sin, but interested and willing to come for us, never taking his focus off of us. And so we do this simple act as an act of trust, and we ask God for help to grow in trust of him. In fact, I wanna offer you a really simple prayer that you can pray all week this week, and I would encourage you to pray now as you take communion. God, you're capable. God, you're good. God, you can be trusted. Help me. God, you're capable, God, you are good, God, you can be trusted. And if you need any reassurance that all of that is true, you need only look to the cup of juice and piece of bread in your hands. When you're ready, go ahead and take communion. fails me all my days I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will see the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able oh i will sing of the goodness of god close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend
So this week, spend some time listening, dive into the Psalms with some people, look closely at what God says about himself, and then invite him into a challenge in your life, one that feels just a little bit risky, and entrust yourself to him in a fresh way and watch how he comes through. If we can support you along the way, we would love to. Head over to canyonridge.org where you'll find a way to get in touch with us along with everything else that you might need to know. Listen, if this was helpful to you, I encourage you, share it with a friend and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. We'll see you soon.